Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay in the back? Okay. Good deal. I hope everyone had a good uh, holiday, Valentine's Day 2024. Glad you're here tonight. And uh, hopefully everyone remembered your Valentine today. And not just today, but every day. I remember, uh, y'all remember Stephen Hunter. He, he always refused to get Stephanie something on Valentine's Day. But he would do it on another day. But I, that's something that always stuck in my head about him. But before we begin, let's go to our Father in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day. We're thankful for all the blessings of life that we often take for granted. We're most thankful for your son and the sacrifice that he made for us all. We're thankful for your word, and we pray tonight as we study it that we will glean the truths from it and that we can apply them to our lives that will help us along the way. We pray that we will share those truths and principles with the people around us as we go through our everyday walk of life. We're also mindful of those who are sick. We pray that you be with them, be with those who are caring for them. We're also mindful of folks who have lost loved ones. We pray that you be with them, comfort them as only you can. Dear Heavenly Father, we also realize that we are weak and we do often fail what you would have us to do, and we pray that you would forgive us of those failures as we repent of them. And just be with us this night. Help us to learn more about you and apply them to our hearts. And as we depart this place, we pray that you will give us a safe journey home. All these things we ask in your son's name. Amen. Tonight we're going to study Jesus praying as he blesses the, the cup and the bread as he institutes the Lord's Supper. What I'm going to try to do, I don't know if we're going to have enough time, but hopefully I can put this together. I would like to visit all four recordings of this in the Gospels and try to pick out the things that each gospel says different, that each gospel tells us a little more about each time this is recorded from a different author. I think it's fun to do that. I always, when I'm studying for something, if I have a certain reference in one of the gospels, if it's recorded in one of the other gospels, I like to go there and, and learn what the other author would say about it. To start with, I want to back up a few chapters in the book of John, uh, John chapter 6, and just start here where there was a little bit of confusion about Jesus and some things that he was telling everyone, and I think this will help us to start here and then we'll move in into the Gospels. I'm going to start at John chapter 6, uh, starting at verse 41. John chapter 6, verse 41. The, the Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me 
has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give in my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? What then, if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, and flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. For that time many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. All right, now we're going to start in Matthew chapter 26. But before we do that, I want to set the stage for this time leading up to the institution of the Lord's Supper. And then shortly following will be the betrayal and, of course, the the crucifixion of Jesus. I'm going to read a short note out of my study Bible that really puts this, it, it, it helped me to understand the exact time frame of this. According to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, before his crucifixion, Jesus sent disciples to prepare the Passover meal and kill the Passover lamb. They note that this task was completed on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the 14th of Nisan on the Jewish calendar, the day before Jesus' crucifixion, Matthew 26, verse 17, Mark 14, and verse 12, Luke 22, verse 7, identifying for us that the meal was prepared on a Thursday in accordance with the law of Moses. Jesus then ate the Passover meal that evening, Thursday night, to the modern-day mind, but the beginning of the Jewish Friday to the Israelites. The Jewish day began at sunset. Jesus' crucifixion then occurred the next day on Friday, the same day as the initial Passover meal to Jews. Before the Jewish Sabbath day began, Friday evening, the Jews, Saturday, note, while some believe the crucifixion and hence the Passover meal, was earlier in the week, Mark 15:42, Luke 23:54, Luke 
and Matthew 27, 62 indicate that the crucifixion took place on Friday, the day before the Sabbath, with Jesus dying as the Sabbath drew near, backing up through the uh, synoptic narratives reveals Jesus being arrested the night before Thursday, before, which would be Thursday night, while Jesus is in the garden at Gethsemane immediately after his last supper with the disciples. The resurrection took place on Sunday, three days later. I know that's a lot, but just kind of, kind of hold that in your mind. Now let's go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 26. Begin at verse 26. Actually, back up to verse 17. Verse 17, Matthew chapter 26. Now on the first day of the feast of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, Where do you want to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When the evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, One of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes as it is written of him. But woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? And he said to him, You have said it. And after they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many, for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now you notice Jesus was was courteous to the to the people who was going to supply the house. So always be courteous to your uh, to your host on how many's coming. So, all right. Now we're gonna we're gonna move into the recording in Luke, and then I want I want us to. Just take note and try to try to notice the difference. Actually, let's do Mark first. I'm sorry. Let's do Mark chapter 14. And I want you to pick out and just see the difference and the different information that is given from Mark about the same the same recording. Mark chapter 14, starting at verse 22. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and then he had given thanks. He gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink the fruit 
of the vine of that day when I drink it new with you in the kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now I want to back up and, and pull out some of the parts that are different. This part here is almost identical to the recording of Matthew. Now let's back up to verse 12. Now on the first day of the unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, Where is the guest room in which you may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared there make ready for us so his disciples went out and came into the city and found it just as he had said to them and they prepared the Passover in the evening he came with the twelve now as they sat and ate Jesus said assuredly I say to you one of you who eats with me will betray me and they began to be sorrowful and to say to him one by one is it I and another said, Is it I? And he answered and said to them, It is one of the twelve who dips with me in the dish. The Son of Man indeed goes, just as it is written of him. But woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. What is different here? Okay. Okay. Matthew said a, a certain man. So if if you're being sent out to do this, you know, who would be a certain man? It would be kind of hard if you think about it. And then what, what does Mark's recording say? about the man okay um, you know you've seen these very busy video games where you got a lot of characters that are either doing the same thing or are carrying the same object I picture myself in the city if I'm going into the city and look for this do you think he's the only one who's carrying a picture How does he know which one to follow? I mean, I know these are kind of very elementary questions, but just put yourself in that story and think about doing this. Okay. I would think so. And then it also says that you follow the man with the picture, but the master of the house is probably not going to be the man that's carrying the pitcher of water. So then... Right. Okay. And what's, what's so interesting about what they find? room's already ready it's already ready so there's there's more to this than just a couple people going to try to find a room to eat the Passover meal there's a whole lot more going on here right or at least the place and and everything they need is there um Another question. Jesus as God in the flesh, was he accountable for keeping and following the laws concerning the Passover? 
Jesus as being God in the flesh, was he accountable for following the laws of the Passover? Okay. He had to, right? He was without sin. If he had not done all the things that were needed to be done from the old law, he would have been committing sin. So that would be a definite yes. Jesus had to follow all these, all the rules of the, of the old law. Any other thoughts? Okay, well, let's move on. Let's go to uh, let's go to the next recording of this. Let's go to Luke. Luke chapter 22. Right. Um, well, it's just like, you know, when they talked about people being baptized, it was kind of similar. Um, but the point was, was Jesus, to be sinless, would definitely have to follow through with all the, the things that needed to be done as far as the old law. Okay, let's start with... Uh, we're in Luke now, chapter 22. And I wanted to bring out something, too, about where it talks about Satan as he entered Judas. Let's start at Luke 22 and verse 3. And it says there, Then Satan entered Judas, surname Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he promised and sought opportunity to, to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. Okay, now let's jump down to verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. So they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters, then you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room. There make ready. So they went and found it just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him, then he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly, the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. We'll stop right there. So what do we find out here? New. Okay. Okay. He is, and and before this recording, before I read this recording, of course, it, it wasn't in my memory, but I was already thinking, I read the first one, and it talked about the disciples were going to do this. And then, in Mark, it mentions two of them are going to do this. And then in Luke, it specifically says who the two are. Now, my thinking would be, who who would be one of the two that would go? Who who took care of the money? Judas. So I'm just assuming that they need this room. Now, you know whether it's free or not, or whether they had to pay rent. I, I'm just thinking of modern day if if we were doing this. But I would have I would have thought it would be. Judas would have been one of them. So why did he send the two that he sent? Danny? That, that's what I'm looking for. That's exactly what I'm looking for, is, is, is trying to read and, and figure some of these things out. Uh, so, anybody else? Anything else you see that's different? So it's very similar, very similar in that aspect. But as they were coming into the city, they were doing the same thing there. So that's kind of interesting. Okay, so they didn't really have to look for him, right? Danny's saying that they it gave more detail about the blood and the bread of what it was to uh, be an emblem of. So it made it more clear. Now, another question I would like to throw out there is, and I don't want to get into 
specifics of the Lord's Supper. We've been covering that on Sunday morning. Josh done a very good job with it. Um, but, you know, it, it's always brought up that of, of drinking or partaking in a worthy manner. And we always kind of, you know, I know there's probably some folks who may be, uh, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? And when I was reading this, when Jesus tells them that they should all partake, and then he specifically knows that Judas is going to betray him. But he, he specifically requests that he partake of the Lord's Supper as well. How, how does that strike you? I mean, by all means, if, if somebody has a doubt of their worthiness of partaking of the Lord's Supper, then obviously something needs to be done. They need to make it right, whatever it is that's, that's, that's bothering them about being worthy. But I just thought it was interesting that immediately after this, that he specifically tells them that it's, it's, it's one of you that's going to betray me, but he still directs them to partake of this. And that kind of, I was like, that's kind of interesting. Thoughts? Sutton, you had... Um, something else that that uh, I'd like to bring out is is at this point, even though it says that Satan had entered Judas, and it, it almost appears that Jesus is pushing this in front of him, and it's like he's he's giving him a chance to not go down this path. At this point, Judas had not betrayed him; he had went he had went. And got the money and it was kind of planned but at this point he hadn't betrayed him and it's almost like Jesus just kept pushing it back in front of him it's like are you sure you want to do this are you sure you want to betray me because it it, it almost it takes my mind back to uh, Queen Esther you know she didn't have to do what she did but what she did it 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 allowed the you know the Jews to continue now, at this, this particular point here, what, what if Judas had not have betrayed Jesus? God's plan would have still followed through. Somebody would have, one of the 12 would have betrayed him. But it didn't have to be Judas. Now, there's prophecy, too, that's tied to all this. 
So, you know, you just, you just sit and think about some of these things. It's like Jesus gave him every chance in the world to repent and not do what, what would eventually happen. And that, that gives me hope, you know, that, that, that we all have a chance to, to do what we're supposed to do, especially when we're uh, confronted with something that, that we kind of know is not good. Um, let's flip over to Second Peter, just to go along with, with this train of thought. Second Peter uh, chapter 3 and verse 9. Second Peter 3 verse 9. Some of y'all probably have this committed to memory. Someone read that for us. Thank you. And then 1 Corinthians 10.13. 1 Corinthians 10.13, another one most of you probably have committed to memory. about 10 minutes. Let's move on to um, John chapter 13. John chapter 13. I'll start at verse 41. I'm in third, sorry, John 13. No, it's, I've, I've missed, I wrote my note down wrong. I'll find it here. Just give me one second. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, chapter 13. Very beginning of chapter 3. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm using my study Bible tonight. And I usually have my other one. John chapter 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, and that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If you do not 
If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is, is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about who he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread... He gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought because Judas had the money box that Jesus had said to him, Buy, the, buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Having received a piece of bread, he then went out, and immediately, and it was night. This is one of the one of my favorite examples that Jesus gave us in all the gospels. And he commands us to do the same to each other. And you think about um, washing people's feet. You can't, you can't get any more humble than that to wash somebody's feet. If you've ever had to care for an elderly person or, or even a child, you know, it's just it, clean and dirty feet is not fun. But when you, when you look at the example that Jesus gave us, he, he was God in the flesh. And you got to look at the time that he that he gave this example, and the circumstances surrounding it with Judas. Jesus still washed Judas' feet. Just think about that. He still washed his feet. How do we react to to things like that? We need to, sometimes we get judgmental and sometimes we, we uh, I don't know, but I think this is one of the best examples there is in all the Bible of, of Jesus washing Judas Iscariot's feet, the one who would betray him. And just, I don't know, it's, it's, it's powerful. Questions or comments? I see wheels turning and 
a lot of thoughts behind eyeballs. Well, I hope this has been good for all of you. Yes, back in the back. That's right. He comes into the room. We need to look for that way of escape. Go out the back door. But, and it mentions here that there's some discussion too in some of these between different Bible scholars about where it talks about the different times that the devil entered Judas. You know, um, it's just like back in the Old Testament with David and Saul. It talks about you know evil spirits that entered them. You know, it can happen more than one time. It, you know, de the devil comes and goes. You know, you get rid of him, but he's going to be back. And we need to be ready when he does come back. So. I think it's just another chance, too, of maybe to stay true to who we are. No matter what everybody was going to do to Jesus, they think they saw coming or how they reacted to the danger and who he was. Here they are. Back to studying the different accounts in the in the Gospels, I, I think it's so good that we that we look at all the accounts. I know, uh, I think it was Jack Ray always said, um, uh, "Don't come to a conclusion on any Bible point until you've exhausted every biblical example that refers to it." And I think this is a this is a very elementary example tonight, but we. We found out so many more things by reading all four accounts. And to me, the last account is tells less about the institution of the Lord's Supper, but when you take the fact that this was done at the same time, at the same place, under the circumstances, it gives it so much more power. And it means so much more that, that Jesus did that. And it's interesting, too, you know, why each author chose to record certain things, but yet we are, we are left with all of it today to read and to put it together like a puzzle. It just, it's very, it's, it's very humbling to me. Say that again. Okay. I don't know if there's scripture that specifically says that, but I would assume he did. Now, that's just my assumption. Now, if somebody else has something to add, then please speak up. Right. 
I see a hand over there somewhere. Okay. Well, it talks about the demons fear and tremble. So, you know, how much they know, you know, I, I, that's, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> so thank you all for coming tonight.